Well, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Thank you guys for coming down. This is the um, LWC Summer Series. Um, and thanks for everybody watching on the YouTube and Facebook live stream for the first time. Um, we're going to be talking about budgeting or finances for life. First class is going to, uh, we're going to really talk heavily about budgeting. Um, it's five weeks in um, June, so we've got um, first week we're going to be doing budgeting. Second week, we're going to be talking about breaking the shackles of debt. The third week, we're going to be talking about giving for life and life more abundantly. Uh, the fourth week, we're going to talk about in, uh, in kingdom investing. And the fifth week, we're going to talk about um, leaving and inheritance. Uh, so without further ado, uh, hopefully the mic's not picking up that rain. Um, I want to get um, I want to um, say a word of prayer before I jump into the word, um, because I think everything that we do should be saturated in prayer especially when it comes to our finances and the time like this. Um, and my title for this teaching um, is Finances for Life um, requires having a, a, a minority mindset. And the minority mindset is not like the majority. You know, the, um, God said that we are the salt of the earth, so that we're going to think differently when it comes to our finances. You know, who else gives 10% of their income to charities or, or to a church? You know, rich people do it because they, they try to avoid taxes and stuff like that. We, we do it because uh, God commanded us to give a tenth of all of our increase. But I'm, I'm not, that's not even a part of the teaching today. But it, the topic is requiring, uh, you know, finances for life requires the having a minority mindset. So, uh, Lord, um, before I minister the word, Lord, I pray, Lord, that everyone in earshot listening to this word, Lord, and by way of the stream, Lord, would have the minority mindset, Lord, that we would clear our minds, Lord, of all of the things that's going on in the world, Lord, inflation, Lord, um, formula shortages, Lord, all these things are a distraction, Lord, to our mindsets, Lord. So I pray, Lord, that we would all listen with our ear, not ears, Lord, but listen with our ear tonight, Lord, our hearts. And I pray, Lord, that the word, Lord, that uh, will be spoken tonight, Lord, will come directly from you, Lord, and fall fresh into our hearts and bear great fruit forward, Lord, in the future. We thank you and praise you, Lord, for this. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, let's jump into the word, y'all. We're going to come out of Genesis 41, and I want this. We got a lengthy passage of scripture to read in the beginning. Um, and if you guys do want to document this, and this um, wasn't a coincidence that God put this scripture on my heart. But Genesis 41, verses 1 through 8 says, After two whole years, Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile, and behold, there came up out of the Nile seven cows, attractive and plump. They fed, they fed in red reed grass, and behold, seven other cows, ugly and thin, came up out of the Nile, and then, uh, and the Nile after them and stood by the other cows on the bank of the Nile. And the ugly and thin cows ate up the seven attractive plump cows. And Pharaoh awoke, and he fell asleep and dreamed a second time. And behold, seven ears of grain, plump and good, were uh, growing on one stalk. And behold, after them sprouted seven ears, thin and blighted by the east wind. And the thin ears um, swallowed up the seven plump full ears, and uh, Pharaoh awoke. And behold, it was a dream. So in the morning his spirit was troubled. He sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. Pharaoh told his dreams, but there was none who could interpret them to Pharaoh. I say that to say, after two whole years, Pharaoh had this dream. Think about this, y'all. Our man of God, pastor, has been telling us, two, when, did the pandemic, when did the pandemic start? About two years ago. Right. About, we are 2022 now. About 2020, the pandemic started. Mm -hmm. Two whole years. Pastor was been telling us, Trent has been giving survival classes, you know, there's going to be a famine in the land. You know, if you, if you look at it, our government right now doesn't know what to do about this inflation -ish, uh, situation we're in, this inflation quagmire that we're in. You know, how, how pri housing prices are skyrocketing. Rent is skyrocketing. You pay more than what I pay for my mortgage to rent a little one-bedroom studio apartment right now. You know, and this is happening all over the United States. Gas prices at an all-time high. Food prices through the roof. Mm -hmm. Our government needs to hear a word in us. Our government in us, we all need to hear a word for the Lord from, for what is to come. Amen. This was written in the word of God. This, this famine was to come. 
Pharaoh had this dream. He was troubled. He contacted the magicians, all the wise men. We got people with PhDs, doctorates, and stuff like that, economists that do not know what's going on with our financial situation right now. They're increasing inflation. I mean, they're increasing uh, interest rates, thinking, okay, this is going to stop the housing prices from going up. Not knowing that it's also, that's not just housing, it's affecting food, gas, everything that we, that we do. They don't know what's going on. Pharaoh had the dream. He, they did not know what was going on. You get the brightest minds of the world that do not know what's going on financially right now. They don't have a minority mindset. They don't have the word of God guiding them. Let's move forward in Genesis and look at verses 25 through 36. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven cows are seven years and the seven good ears are seven years. The dreams are one. The seven lean and ugly cows that came up after uh, them are seven years. The seven empty ears blighted by the east wind are also seven years of famine. It is, uh, uh, it is, as I told Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Uh, there will come seven years of great plenty throughout the, uh, all the land of Egypt. But after them, there will arise seven years of famine, and all of the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. The famine will consume the land, and the plenty will be unknown in the land by reason of famine that will follow. Um, for it will be very severe and doubting, and, and the doubting of Pharaoh's dream means that this thing is fixed by God, and God will shortly bring it about. Now, therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning wise man, um, a wise man, uh, and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh proceed and appoint overseers over the land, and take one fifth of the produce um, of the land of Egypt during the seven, plenty, seven plentiful years, and let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming and store up the grain under the authority of Pharaoh for the food uh, in the cities and let them keep it. That food shall be a reserve for the land against the seven years of famine that are to occur in the land of Egypt so that the land may not perish through the famine. God sent Pharaoh, a man of God, mm -hmm. who was in prison with the word. Mm -hmm. Pharaoh took heed to that word and he appointed Joseph over in Egypt. And he, you know, used the, he, that's why he took that wise man, and that wise man took one fifth of the produce of the land and set up a, uh, a reserve when they had the plenty. The plenty. We got people um, in our church building houses, buying houses, flipping houses, starting businesses. We had our years of plenty. Now it's time for us to set aside a fifth, set aside a reserve. Prepare for a famine because I'm going to go over the statistics, but all these years we've only been running at, uh, what do they call it, uh, inflation at about 2.5% every single year. 2020 happened, and then after 20, right when 2020 happened, we went from like 2% to 8%. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's going to keep going up and up and up. We may, have, we may be transitioning into a famine where 8% may be just, that's the norm now. That's what inflation is now. We no longer at the 2% game anymore. We were at 2% for years, which is still kind of bad. You're like, man, you know, you got to put your money in an account that makes more than 2% so that you can keep your dollar being a dollar. Um, but um, it's important for us not to be conformed to this world, not to look at, oh, everybody's buying houses, everybody's buying cars, everybody's buying this, everybody's buying that. You know, that's the years of plenty. We got famine on the way. You know, uh, the word of God says in Romans uh, 12, verse 2, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Um, when we start a budget, you know, it's God's will for us to prosper and everything. But if, if we don't, you know, um, if we conform to this world, the world tells the United States, especially to consume. We have a GDP, gross domestic product, uh, which is a measurement of what we consume and what we import and export and all this stuff. But they want to know how much money we spend and stuff like that. The world is telling us to spend, 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 not really save, budget, or invest. Mm -hmm. um, 
And the key, you know, uh, when we think about this, think about money and debt, you know, we got to have a minority mindset, you know, because uh, when I say the word budget, what words this, in your mind, you don't have to blurt them out, come to your mind, but, you know, only, you know I've, when I've said, oh, I'm on a budget, you know, people say, man, only poor people live on a budget. <laughs> you know, I mean, if you look at our government, they're running a, a, a deficit every single year. They have to borrow more money because our GDP, the money that we make from people buying stuff, for, from, for, from us exporting goods and for us importing goods, we import more than we export. That means we don't produce. China is beating us in exports. If you look at every single thing, including this iPad I'm using, including that Sony camera, that laptop back there that's running stream, I bet you can look somewhere it's, it's not made in America. Thank God Intel was bringing their stuff back to America, but most of the stuff is still made in, in China. You know, I don't want to get into the borrow, uh, you know, on the lender type thing. We're gonna get we're gonna get into that later, uh, but um, you know. How many think that God wants us to live in bondage? You know, no one wants to live in bondage. I used to be there, living in bondage, thinking I was doing it. You know, I was, I was living off 100% of my income. And when I came to Living Word Church, and the, and the pastor preached the word and said, God commanded everybody to give a tenth of all of their increase. I'm like, a tenth? Where am I going to find a tenth? <laughs> I'm living off 100% of my increase. I got all the video games. I got, all, you know, I got everything I want. I got designer shirts from men and warehouses and all this stuff, but I didn't have a, a tenth to give to the church. Do not be conformed to this world. Amen. We got to have a renewing of our mind. It takes a renewing of your mind. I mean, people are watching on the stream. If you go to the church and you, know, you, you think about the pastor is taking all your money, you got to renew your mind. The pastor's not taking all, all of our money. Some people think that God, God is trying to set order in our finances. You know, so God set the solitary in families. He also, that means he sets it in our finances too. But I, I had a worldly view of finances. You know, truth of the matter is if you're living off of 100% of your income, you're already in, living in bondage. You can't give 10%. You can't save or invest. You're already living off of... Uh, you know, um, more, um, more than what you, uh, God intended you to live off on. Um, but, um, you know, statistics will have you believe that, you know, the world is in bondage. But, you know, the word, word of God, it upsets all the apple cart. And Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord of hosts, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. In the NIV version, it says, For I, have, for I know the plans I have for you, declared the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. We serve a just God, y'all. If we sow seeds of debt, we're going to reap debt. You know, if we sow the seed of prosperity, we're going to reap prosperity in our lives. If we, if we, if we plan accordingly. He says, I got plans. Of the, uh, you know, I got plans. You know, speaking of that, in Proverbs 21, verse 5, it says, The plans of the diligent surely lead to plenty, but uh, those of everyone who is uh, hasty surely to poverty. I want to pause for a moment because I really want to break that particular scripture down. The plans of the diligent sure lead surely to plenty. We're talking about budgeting tonight. It's not the most fancy uh, topic. It's not the most flashy thing. It's not going to get you to jump out your seat and say, scream hallelujah. The plans of the diligent lead surely to plenty. You know, budgeting requires diligence. It requires planning. To be diligent Let's break it all the way down. Dil being diligent defined uh, means constant in effort to accomplish something, attentive and persistent in doing anything. It also means done or pursued with persevering attention. You guys know this already, most of you guys watching, people don't know it by stream, but I have a, now, <laughs> many years, many years, I've been doing it for many, many years now, um, I plan diligently my budget. I just don't budget for one month. I budget for the entire year. In fact, this year, I have a budget set every single month for the whole year, into 2023, and all the way out into 2024. Every single thing that I spend, I account for it. If I go out and get some gas right now, I'm gonna go home, go into my YNAB app, and put, I spent $60 on gas. 
Last year, last, last year I spent $40 on gas to get gas, gas at the same time last year. My gas has went up by $20. But you, diligence, constant effort to accomplish something, plans of the diligent lead surely to plenty. When you're actually you are running, operating your expenses out of a budget, you know exactly what's going to be in your account next year because you're following every week, every month, all the way up to the year, and you know at the end of the year, I'm going to have this net income in my nest egg because I followed the plan. I diligently budgeted. I, I, I plans are diligently surely to plenty. Every year when you create, we're going to talk about making a budget, but every year when you do your annual budget, now we're going to talk about how to do a monthly budget today. I'll show you a 10,000 foot view, 10,000 foot view of an annual budget. But when you do your monthly budget, there should be a net income that you roll over to the next month. We'll go over that later. Say if you got $1,000, you make $1,000, that's it and you spend 800, that's $200 of net income. You need to roll that over every month. By the end of the year, you should have about $2,400 to your name. Not a lot of money, but it's positive. But uh, we're gonna talk about that. But those of everyone, of everyone, again, we're going back to Romans, but those of everyone who is hasty, surely to poverty. You can't wait to get anything. You gotta buy it on the credit card. Amazon has a thing where you can easily click it, one, click it, one, uh, one click buy, and it's already come to your doorstep next two days. Yeah. Be, renew it. Look, do not be conformed to this world. The world makes it so easy to spend money these days. They make it so easy. I don't want to cook. I'm just gonna go over there and, and buy something from the fast food place. It's gonna be done as soon as I pull up after I pay my my money. As soon as I get to the thing, my, my food's gonna be right there. It, it, it's, it's so convenient. The hasty, I don't want to sit there and make a meal. I, you know, to be hasty can be defined as this, done or made in a hurry, fast and typically superficial. Fast food is not good for you, y'all. Uh, now, to be transparent, I had a health scare, and God told me I need to stop eating bad. We need to stop eating fast food. I'm going to start cooking again. I done lost like 30-something pounds. I look like I'm wearing my father's clothes tonight. But I'm not, I'm not, I'm not playing around. When you, we have to make a budget for our lives or else because there, there's a famine coming in the land and if we don't take heed, we're going to be wanting. We're going to be lost. Acting too quickly, overeager, or impatient, exhibiting lack or, 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 of careful thought or consideration. Being hasty can also even make you prone to uh, anger or irritable. Mm. Yeah. You know, um, there's people who, who can't get stuff out. They're they mad. You know, they, they, might, they might go out there and do something for it. You know, we, we get into this famine. You can't get no baby formula. You might go do something to somebody to get some baby formula. You know, how many of us, of our show of hands, think that God is just not doing it quick enough for us? I should have had my, my business should have been making whatever by now. You know, I, I should have got that promotion by now. We got to be careful about being hastily. Getting something too fast before we're ready for it can, can lead us surely to poverty. Look at all the NBA athletes and the NFL stars that... Terrell Owens and you know uh, I forget I kind of think of all the name Antoine Walker and all all these athletes Herschel Walker they got all this money and then they lost it they they earned more money than you and I some of us will never earn in our lifetime and after they got out of the NFL NBA money gone hasty surely to poverty it doesn't really matter how much money you have it's about how much money comes in versus how much is going out. You want to cut off the alcohol. It's very simple. I can really teach this class in five minutes, but I really wanted to drill down into the mindset because we got to know that it's important to listen to God's word and uh, read, the, uh, read the word of God to see what happened to people who didn't take heed to God's word when he told us this was going to happen. Um, let me go up a little bit here because I'm um, 23. I've got a good time here. Let's look at some statistics. Look at the national debt. As of May of 2022, national debt is at $30 trillion, $403 billion. Simple math. It's a mismatch between spending and revenue. If you look at our GDP, and I mentioned this earlier, GDP is a measure of the total value of the country's economic output. It's the total, it's the total of the country's personal consumption, business investment, government spending, net exports minus imports. We have generated 2019, we, you, the United States, we made $21 trillion. 2020, we made $20 trillion. 2021, we made $22 trillion. But we got a national 
debt of $30 trillion. That's a net negative of at least eight to nine, $10 trillion, depending on what year it is. We're borrowing $30 trillion. We're making $22 trillion. We're always going to be in a hole as a country. That's about $91,000 per American citizen, legal American citizen in our country, if you wanted to put all the debt onto your people. And they're doing that invisibly through inflation. It's a hidden tax. If I make you go to the store and pay, pay more, we're going to get into that. It's a hidden tax. I don't have to tax you directly. I can tax you indirectly. I can make you spend more and more money for your gas. I can make you spend more and more money for your food. I can make, make you spend more and more, 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 more money for your clothes. Historically, you know, deficits were due to national emergencies like um, war and the Great Depression. I, I, I looked at statistics before I planned to, do, um, to teach you guys this course, and I went all the way back from 1929 all the way up to 20, 2022. And I saw our national deficit, and I was looking like, okay, this, that was a good reason why we did that. We had the Great Depression. That was a good reason we did that. We went to World War I. We went to World War II. We had Vietnam. We had this and we had that. And then, you know, I was looking like, okay, then that's 1970, the government, you know, um, Nixon took us off the gold standard, which messed up the whole dollar. And now they print money that doesn't really have any value. Fiat currency really is just a piece of paper. And it's, um, the inflation really takes away from the middle class, it squeezes the middle class, it crushes the lower, uh, the, the lower class yeah. and poverty and stuff like that. So I just want to get you guys into the mindset of what's going on here. You know, we have rising health care costs. You know, I looked at the years going forward, like in 24, how many serious citizens we going to have and all this stuff. I'm like, dude, this is, this is, this is crazy. We got shortages in baby formula. Our tax system's broken. We don't know how to do it. You know, we should do it the God way. There's our tax everybody 10%. Bottom line, just, just do it. You know, we don't, our tax system doesn't bring enough money in to cover that $30 trillion deficit. You know, um, but we don't have to live that way. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I'm gonna keep saying that. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Do not be conformed to this world. You know, um, the inflation, the government, you can't listen to them. You can't be conformed to this world. You listen to the government, they lying to you. In the beginning, when the pandemic started, we're going to print out this stimulus money. They said, that, you know, and this stimulus, it's not going to cause inflation. The stimulus, you know, this inflation that we're seeing right now, this little spike, is transitory. They're using all these big words. <laughs> transitory meaning, like, it's only going to be for a short little while. It's not going to have no effect. Oh, and, and then, then, then that was a lie. Then 2008, you know, there's no risk of the real estate uh, market crashing. It crashed. And then when, when after it crashed, there's no risk of the housing crisis hitting the other parts of the market. And then the entire stock market crashed. You cannot be conformed to this world and listen to the government think they're going to tell you the truth. You know, they said that there was no risk for a financial market crash. Now, now we're seeing the, the stock prices even, even start hit, getting hit now, too. This housing bubble, it's not just the housing bubble. You guys got, got to get prepared for a famine in the land. Um, and I was looking at the charts, you know, I wish I had some printouts, but... 2012, inflation was at 1.7%. 2013, 1.5%. 2014, it was at 0.8%. 2015, 0.7%. We're under a percent for inflation each year. Then 2016, 2.1. 2017, 2.1. 2018, 1.9. 2019, 2.3. You notice those lower percent, you know, you know, Trump was in office around that, uh, 2016. So Obama, and that, he didn't do that bad, actually, for inflation. He was under 1%. Trump got it. We went up to 2%. Okay. And then... Um, 2019, 2.3. 2020, we went down to 1.4% inflation. 2021, we hit 7% inflation. 2022, we hit 8.3% inflation. That's a huge jump. And especially if you're making the same amount of money you was making yeah. those years, everything costs you 6 to 7% uh, more than what it cost you last year. You, and, and even if you got a 9 or 8% raise, you really didn't get a raise. Yeah. The years are plenty. Store up. I don't know what next year is going to bring. But looking at these trends from 2021 at 7% inflation, 2022 for 8.3% inflation, I can surmise in 2023 we might be at 9% inflation. Store up your reserves so that when the famine hits, Living Word Church, or the body of Christ who's watching on the stream, you're going to have enough bread for your family. Store up. 
you know, energy prices rose over 30% this year. I know I'm throwing out a whole bunch of things, you know, numbers and stuff like that, but that's the mi mindset. Hot dogs, hamburgers, inflation, ground beef up 16.4%. Hot dogs, 6%. Bacon, 17.7%. Steaks, 11%. Chicken legs, 16%. You know, 2021, a pound of hot dogs in April would have cost you $3.81. Now, a pound of hot dogs would cost you $5.22. Same pack of hot dogs. So, and this is one thing I want to want to read to you guys. So, I want you guys to know that God said this was going to come and this is what he was going to do. Besides supply chain issues and the pandemic-related inflation spikes, recent bad weather has contributed to low crop yields. Russia's invasion has increased uh, wheat and other prices. Now, I want you to pay close attention. Recent bad weather has contributed to lower crop yields. That's God. Man can't control the weather. God told Pharaoh that this is what I'm, I'm going to do. We shouldn't be surprised by this. We have a minority mindset. Keep on reading more of these statistics. Credit card debt, beginning in 2021, uh, credit card debts totaled to $860 billion dollars. That's consumer credit card debt, not even what the businesses are borrowing to run their businesses. Student loan debt, 2022, I'm a part of this group. Um, outstanding debt in the United States, my wife's part of this, um, $1.75 trillion in student loan debt. Homelessness, this is terrible. Over 580,000 people have experienced homelessness in January of 2020. And, um, I only have this on my paper, but it was something that stuck out to me. They said 39% of the, of the homeless. 39% in men in their 20s. It's sad. America is in the crisis, y'all. Proverbs 22, verse 7 says, The rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. America's been living in the crisis. I already told you guys about our GDP and about our national debt. And I was on that website and it was, I had to turn it off because that the number kept going up and up and up and up. I was like, is that 30 trillion? And I kept seeing the little thousands of dollars keep going up. And I'm like, man, when is it going to hit the 305 trillion? Because it, it just kept going up. The government has been printing money like crazy, stimulus money, um, PIP, I forget what they call them, the loans for the uh, people, small business, PPE loans or whatever and all this stuff. They're, they're printing money like crazy. They, they call it, this is the um, technical definition of what they call it, quantitative easing, where they just go and print money and it devalues the dollar so that they can keep the economy stimulated. So they can make it look like we're still making money because we're giving people with a uh, worldly mindset money and then they're gonna go out with this stimulus money and they're gonna go buy some new Jordans, they're gonna go buy some uh, Xbox Series X, they're gonna buy whatever. That's quantitative, it's, it's stimulating the market, but it's not really, it's devaluing the dollar. Mm. We're in a crisis, y'all. You know, although the, the world considers America to be the richest country in the world, are we really? Um, as a whole, we really are in bondage. If you look at the number, I said about 91,000 per American, really what, what, what it would take if you put the, the, the national debt on us. And there's not many of us that can pay off $91 trillion, especially it ain't our debt, it's the government. They using that money for services that they say that they do, they give it to us, but they run, they racking up uh, some serious debt. So, you know, in these crises, it creates leaders. Leaders like Joseph, leaders like our pastor, you know, leaders like Brad, leaders like Sister Cox, leaders like Worthy, leaders like Justin. Justin, you a leader, man. You a leader. You know, hold your head up high, man. You're, you're a good athlete, good kid. You're sitting here, you're paying attention, you run the stream. You know, this is, it may not be a crisis to you yet because Elder Lovejoy is covering you. But pretty soon you're going to be your own man and you're going to have to cover your family. So listen to this word and uh, let it get into your heart, let it get into your mind. You're a leader. And when you face a crisis, remember the word of God. Don't remember what I said. Remember what the word of God said. Do not be conformed to this world, but transformed by the ruling of your mind. So, you know, our government might be slave to the lender, but we don't have to be. We must be transformed by the ruling of your mind. I just said that. So we need to dust off our budget. Renew it. Begin to lead our families financially. To renew something, it means to uh, make like new, restore to freshness, vigor, or perfection. 
And I, I say that because all these years I've been budgeting. Man, I, if I have my software here, I'll show you. I, it goes all the way back even before I got married. That's why my wife, I think she, you know, she really liked me because I showed her the spreadsheet, the, 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 the bank account, and I was like, hey, I got a plan. It wasn't even perfect. You know, at the time, I was still living with my grandmother. Then we got our apartment and stuff like that, and I was like, I got the plan. This is the electric bill, water, this, 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 and this is how, this is how much I'm going to have in my account six months from now. And she liked that. You know, but think, but, 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 but think things came up, you know, to restore freshness or vigor or for perfection. When you create your budget, it's not going to be perfect the first time you create it. Especially now, you go out there and fill your gas tank up, and but man, $60, I only budgeted for like 150 for this month. I'm about to be at 300 before the month is out. Now, but don't, don't, don't worry about it. Just put it in the spreadsheet and say, this is what it is. And keep it moving. But as long as you've got things in order, it's written, not only is written now, but remember diligence. You've got to actually follow the budget. If you're going to write, we're going to talk about how to create a budget, but you have to follow it. That's where the diligence comes in. Dil plans of the diligent lead surely to plenty. Remember that. But if you're hasty, but oh, I'm going to write the budget, but I don't feel like go going here, filling this stuff out and saying, I, I done spent this, spent this, spent that. I, I just want to, you know, spend the money, get it done. I'll, I'll look at my bank account later. You're being hasty. It's going to lead surely to poverty. I'm always going back to these scriptures so we can get it into our mindset. And uh, speaking of mindset, um, and I want to probably slow this down because we're at 736. I'm moving really fast. Well, let me, let me define this more. You know, um, vigor speaks to us of our physical or mental strength, energy, or force. When you make your budget, you know, it does take... Um, people don't think about this, but I, I work a desk job in IT, and sometimes I come home and I'm drained. Yeah. I know, I've been using my mind trying to figure out all these complex problems and stuff like that, but making your budget, it's going to require some physical energy. You're going to have to sit down, write down that paper, type on that uh, computer, that spreadsheet, use that software, mental strength, energy, force. You know, uh, it takes a lot you know, to sit down and get it done, but you've got to get it done. Um, let's, think, let's look at this. Five mindsets that are keeping you poor. Number one, it's having a poor mindset. And uh, this comes out of Matthew 25, verses 24 to 25. Then he who had received one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. I think we heard this a couple weeks ago. But it doesn't matter how much talent you have. You could be LeBron James, Allen Iverson, Jeff Bezos. You know, you could be, you know, a Bradley Bird, a Todd Hutchinson, Cheryl Hutchinson, Worthy. Don't matter how much talent you have. It's about the mindset. We shouldn't take the gifts, talents, abilities, and skills that God has given us and simply hide them into the ground. We need to make a budget, put it on paper, so that we can make our money work for us and not us for working for the money. Uh, you know, what's the difference between being poor and broke? It's mindset. You know, if you're broke, um, it's a temporary thing. I'm, I'm just broke for right now, but if you're poor, it's a mindset thing. You can get some money, and next thing you know, it's already spent before you even got it. You know, poor mindset doesn't have anything to do with how much money you make. You know, if you want to become healthy, stop finding problems with everything and start finding opportunities and solutions. Mm -hmm. That's really the big difference between a, a poor and a broke person. You know, a bro broke person, I'm, I'm about to find out. I'm, I'm about to go cut some grass, and now I, I just learned how to edit some videos, and, I, and it actually pays quite lucratively. You know, I'm going to go um, edit some videos. I'm going to do something, fix somebody's computer. We're going to make this money. We're going to sell some furniture. We had to sell furniture to have our baby and stuff and sell candy bar. Whatever we had to do, we was doing it. And, we, and, we, and, we, and, we, and we were, even though we didn't have the money, we didn't let our mindset get us down to say, we're not going to be able to have this baby because we just can't pay the money for this IVF treatment. We've got to have a, 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 the mindset. Number two, second uh, mindset that keeps us, um, that, that's keeping us poor. Getting too comfortable with debt. This comes out of Hebrews 12, verses one. verse 1. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, 
let us lay aside, let us lay aside every weight and sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. You know, this is saying so much. Some of us are comfortable with debt. Now, I am very, very uncomfortable with debt. I got some cards in here, but uh, you know, you know, these things, very lightweight. They could, these could easily shackle you down to where you are robbing Peter to pay Paul. You're working five or ten jobs. You're not even coming to church anymore. You can't even tithe anymore. You, you, Lord forbid, you cannot put any money into the building fund because you're paying for all these little debts. Lay aside every weight and the sin that's so easily snares You don't get comfortable with that. Well, oh, it's only $15 a month. It's only X, Y, don't get too comfortable with that. Don't, don't do it. You know, people are praying to get approved for a credit card to get 15% off at Kohl's or something. People are praying, you know, uh, I forget what a football player it was. I think it was, um, what was his name? Play for the Browns. Where do you know who he is? Jim Brown. He said that um, black people pay for what they want and beg for what they need. We need to lay aside the weight that so easily ensnares us. Imagine what you can do when you make your spreadsheet and you eliminate. Just imagine. Make the spreadsheet. If you got credit card debts, put it on the spreadsheet. But then I want you to imagine. Have a copy. I'll make two copies. Have a spreadsheet with your credit card debts that currently exist. Now think with your um, seed of faith. What if the, I don't have this credit card payment? What if I don't have that credit card payment? What if I don't have this card payment? What if I don't have any of these unnecessary debts that I have on my spreadsheet? What does my new spreadsheet look like? Don't get too comfortable with that. See, I'm not comfortable with that. I don't want any debt because I know with the money me and my wife bring in, if we don't have any debt, we have uh, an abundance Amen. of uh, liquid assets to be able to do whatever we want to do with them and not have to worry about praying for what we want. We can simply go just buy what we want and not have to go worry about paying interest because they charge. And speaking about inflation again, going back to that, I told you all the interest rates are going up. You see it in the mortgage prices. You're also going to see it in your credit cards. You got these credit cards lingering around. You're getting too comfortable with that. And I told you it's the second point of getting too comfortable with that. My, this is the second mindset that keeps us poor. You're going to be surprised when you're going to see that credit card shoot up to 40% interest, even if it's a little thousand dollar card. After you pay your little minimum monthly payment, they're going to come back with an interest charge like BAM! And you're going to have like another $70 on there, even though you didn't pay $40. You're still negative. That means you're going to be paying that card off for the rest of your life if you want to keep, keep making the minimum payments. But if uh, we're going to talk about making a spreadsheet, and um, next week we're going to talk about how to aggressively break the shackles of debt so that you can, um, I can't remember the, the whole title, but we're going to break the chains of debt pretty much. But that's going to require some radical moves in your, uh, in your budgeting and your planning. But right now we're just going to talk about this getting everything on the table, your budget. Um, the third mindset that keeps us poor, sticking around uh, in the toxic environments and people. This comes from Proverbs 15, verse 21. Folly is joy to him who is destitute of discernment, but a man of understanding walks uprightly. With, without counsel, plans go awry, but in a multitude of counselors, they are established. Is this my water? <coughs> I don't know. I'm going to take it. Mm. All right. <coughs> Number three. Third mindset that keeps us poor, sticking around in toxic environments and people. <coughs> Some of us have succumbed to the internet fake rich lifestyle. Watch the video on this. People doing all kinds of stuff to make themselves look rich. They got toilet seats, real toilet seats. They put the toilet seat behind their head, or behind their head, acting like they was on a plane with a fan blowing, like they like they on the plane. <laughs> You're around toxic. Social media can be a toxic environment. You can look at somebody's life online and think, man, they rich. 
you know, I'm, Jesse, I'm, I'm glad you got a young person in the room. Man, that, that's too much sauce right there, man. He doing, he doing too much, man. You know, he just adorned with, with all, all the jewelry and every, everything on. Too much sauce. You know, if you surround yourself, you know, in the digital world, you know, you're going to make yourself feel bad and make you, make you feel like, man, I'm going to have to go out there and buy, buy whatever he got. I don't even care if, if it take me a year to pay it off. You're around a toxic environment and people. You know, we got to transform our environment, which is going to help transform our minds. You guys being in here right now is having your minds transformed. The people watching on stream, your minds is being transformed by just the word, hearing the word of God. And, um, you know, people in a toxic environment, you know, they're okay with uh, living in debt, living paycheck to paycheck. You know, you know it's, uh, for them, it's abnormal to save and invest money. Oh, you, you in the stock market? You, you must be white. I've heard it before. Wow. You, you invest in the stock market? That's what white people do. Yeah. That's, that's what, that's, that, that, you, you, can't make, you can't make money investing in the stock market unless you got money. I beg to differ. I, 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 I don't want to show personal accounts, but I, I've made quite a bit of money in the stock market past, these past few years. I actually, I, I, don't, I don't want to get into it, but get out of those toxic environments. Mindsets that keep people poor. The fourth mindset that keeps people poor, priorities not in order. This comes from uh, two scriptures, Matthew 6, 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. And then in Psalms 37, verse 4, it says, Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. This is priorities, y'all. I really didn't get a breakthrough, even though before uh, I really got knee-deep in my relationship with God, uh, this is even when I was, when we was very first married and stuff. I didn't have my priorities in order when it came to my finances. I may have had a spreadsheet and had everything written down, but I didn't even have God on the list at all when I made my spreadsheet. He wasn't on the list at all. Every now and then I would come to church and I would give $20. Mm -hmm. And that would be it. And I may not give another $20 for like a whole other month. He wasn't prioritized at all. Then one day I told my wife, I said, you know, babe, I'm going to start tithing. And this is how I'm going to do it. I'm, I'm cutting this out, this out, this out, this out. I see I'm spending all this. I, got, I, got, I easily got 10% right here. And the moment I started tithing, the moment I prioritized God, things just, yeah. I mean, it just mm -hmm. transformed. Everything transformed. We started getting letters in the mail saying, hey, you don't owe this much in your electricity, but I'm like, oh, you sure? And he was like, yeah, yeah, we're going we to credit this back to you. And all, I mean, it was all kind of, you know, good stuff going on. You know, uh, the job, everything was lining up. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, God. Mm -hmm. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added. Delight yourself in the Lord. I'm going to read these scriptures again. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. You know, um, kind of makes me want to tear up a little bit thinking about this, but imagine if I didn't prioritize God all the way back then. It had to be like 2013 or something like that. Um, will we even have our son TJ today? And he shall give you the desires of your heart. Prioritize God. That's um, the fourth mindset that will keep us poor. Not paying yourself. Um, that's the fifth and final um, reason or thing that can uh, keep us from uh, a mindset that keeps us poor. This comes out of Proverbs um, 6, verses 6 through 8. It says, go to the ant, you sluggard, consider her ways and be wise, which having no captain, overseer, or ruler, provides her supplies in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. Prioritize the kingdom. This is how it works. First, and I think Elder Cox pastor, somebody says this, first you pay God, you pay yourself, and then you pay your bills. You know, not paying yourself it's a poor mindset because most people who are poor, when they get, before they even get their money, they got to go to the check cashing place and check cashing place or whatever, and they say, hey, you want you you an overdraft on this, so before you get your money, we got to take our cut first. We can't, you ain't going to get your money to all this stuff. After you, after you done paid all your bills, you ain't got no money to pay yourself. 
once we learn how to pay ourselves, even if you don't, have, you don't have to buy anything, it's like, all right, I'm just going to set a little $100 aside for myself. Twelve months later, you just set $1,200 aside. Go do something nice for yourself or someone you love. Bless somebody. Pay yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, make, it a, make a, uh, an investment with your relationship with God. I went out and bought like a $150 Bible, um, you know, from a guy I listened to on the radio. You know, I went out and bought Dave Ramsey books. I went out and bought, out and bought um, online courses, uh, 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 what was it, investment um, option stuff with Dan, Dan Seal, your financial issues. I wanted to know how to make my own investment portfolio and start investing my own stocks and stuff like that. I invested in my education for finances, you know, and, uh, and coupling with, with the word of God so that I could see what God says about my finances too. And the reason I went with Dan Silly because he, he, he um, teaches you how to invest in biblically sound companies. Now we got about eight minutes, so I want to um, slingshot over here. Now we're going to get to budgeting. I told you I could teach this in like in 10 minutes, but I wanted to get your mindsets first. Okay, so what does a budget do for you? Uh, a budget is a key piece of, strong, of a strong financial foundation. Having a budget helps you manage your money, control your spending, save more money, pay off debt, stay out of debt. I'll read it again for those on the stream. This is what a budget does. A budget is a key piece of a strong financial foundation. Having a budget helps you manage your money, control your spending, save more money, pay off debt, and stay out of debt. Now that's the traditional budget. You know, biblical budgeting. budgeting. What is biblical budgeting? Because, you know, we're over a minority mindset. In Luke 14, 28, it says, For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? A biblical budget is a little bit different. It's a little bit more specific. It's a little bit more precise. A biblical budget is what I call the 10, 10, 80 principle. First 10 is your 10% that goes to God. The second 10%, you pay yourself. The third um, 80%, that's what you use for your living expenses. You live off of 80% of your income. You uh, tie 10, you save 10. Now, we're going to build a uh, one-month budget. Want to kind of break down the budget in a nutshell for you guys really quick, 52 after. Um, so I need to, I should have printed printouts. We got this whiteboard house thing. Ah, you guys will have to write this down if you, if you brought paper. Sorry about that. And for you guys on stream, you will have to write it down anyways. But there's so many videos online to learn how to budget and stuff like that. But thanks, everybody, for joining. But this is what we're going to do. We're going to build a one-month budget. Um, there's tools you can use online, like Mint. I use YNAB. There's Honeydew, Pocket Guard, and the basic old-school uh, Excel spreadsheet. Or there's your good old pen and paper, old school. Um, so the components of a budget, write this down. This is the most important part I can... Uh, say to you guys, the components of a budget. When you're building a budget, whether you're doing it on a spreadsheet or whether you're using software, um, you want to list your income. What do you make weekly, bi-weekly, monthly? What do you make on a monthly basis? That's number one. Number two, you want to add up all of your expenses. Now, for some people who have never made a budget, this will be very difficult. Because sometimes we have auto pay and we got some stuff that we paid and some stuff that we don't want to pay. So we act like we don't know it's there. Mm -hmm. Add up all of your expenses that you have. All this needs to go in the spreadsheet. You got a list of you got to list your income. Number one. Number two, you got to add up all your expenses, even the ones you want to act like they ain't there. Number three, um, when you, what you do is you calculate your net. Now, what do you do to calculate your net? It's simple, just like I told y'all with the GDP and our uh, national debt. You take your income minus your expenses, and whatever number you get, that's your net income. 
What that means is, if you make $4,000 a month, that's a good amount of money. You make $4,000 a month, and you spend $3,000 in expenses, you take $4,000 minus the $3,000, you have positive $1,000 left to your name. That's for you to roll over to the next month. So the next month, when you make $4,000, plus now you got that extra thousand, you got 5,000 minus 3,000 worth of expenses, now you got $2,000. And you do this every single month for the whole year. And when you do that, if you follow your plan, you will, ha you will ha definitely have plenty. Now, of course, some people are gonna list their income, they're gonna list their expenses, they're gonna calculate their net, and they're gonna realize, oh, I make $4,000 a month, but I spend $4,500 a month you know, in, um, in my living. I'm negative $500. So that means either one, one or two things. Um, I'm borrowing money to uh, pay for this extra 500 by, by way of credit card or by side hustle because I don't make enough money in my job so I gotta have another job so I can make the extra 500 to cover my $4,500 worth of bills. And then the fourth thing you do, the fourth component of the budget, you track your spending. Um, that's irregular expenses, annual expenses, monthly expenses, semi-annual. You gotta track your spending. So there's four components to it. I'll list them off again. You list your income when you make your budget. You add up your expenses. You can, do them, you can kind of do them side by side. You know, and then, um, once you get all your expenses, you calculate your net, and then you, then you track your spending. That's how a budget works. You know, I can write that stuff on the board for you guys, but it ain't gonna do nothing but go on one hand out the other. You gotta go home and do this yourself. Personal finance, and I've learned this over a lot of, you know, just my personal, um, me doing it. Personal finance is 80% behavior and 20% knowledge. I stand up here before you guys today as a man of God. I, I don't have a finance degree or financial background. I'm an IT guy. I got a, a network engineering degree, but I don't have a financial degree. Um, but I'm diligent about my budget and I'm passionate about teaching everyone on how to have good finances, finances for life. It's 80% behavior. Um, at this point, I'm on autopilot when it comes to that stuff. My, my, my spreadsheet's always on, on point because every, every day I'm, I'm looking at, oh, okay, oh, where's this one cent came from? That was the interest payment for the bank. Oh, let me go ahead and correct my spreadsheet. You know, so. Let me uh, read this last scripture into your uh, guys' reading. We've got three minutes, two minutes left. This comes out of Habakkuk 2, verses 2 through 3. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets, that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Um, I'll say that to say, when you make your budget on the, uh, on the spreadsheet, you're making it plain on tablets. And then you're going to read that thing, and you're going to I, I run with it. Calculate, you know, we're going back to those four points. Track your spending, you know, because at a point in time, once the month's up, the bank's going to settle up with you, regardless of you having the budget or not. And it will speak, and it ain't going to lie. And then they're going to say, hey, you overdraft. Or, hey, you paid us, you know, whatever. It ain't gonna lie, the banks are tracking their money better than you are. It's important for you to track your stuff because I had a thing with Fidelity where I moved some money around there selling some stocks and they took an extra $100 from me. And I was like, hold up. I was like, hey, I see an extra $100 going here. I, I need y'all to uh, reconcile this. They said, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Hutchinson, and they, they, they got the money back, but I tracked my stuff. Um, lastly, I wanna say to you guys, um, what you can do, I got one minute. So with the, with the monthly budget, do this, this is a challenge. Take your monthly expenses, everything, everything that you have to pay. Multiply it by 12, every single thing. Light bill, water bill, gas, groceries. Multiply that by 12. That will give you what I call the 10,000 foot view of your finances. It's gonna show you what you spend annually in your tithe, what you spend annually in groceries, what you spend annually on entertainment, what you spend annually on um, food, car payments, gas, everything. And, and, and then calculate 
your, your, uh, your annual net income to your expenses and see what you got left at the end of the year. That's a 10,000 foot view of your finances. That's the way to see how much money you're going to have before the year's up. And trust me, when you budget like this, you can plan for trips and different things because you know what's going to be in your account six months from now, a year from now. Now, for me, two years from now, I plan for my wife's 40th birthday. I already got money saved. We already put money down to rent the hall and everything. The money's already there because I planned for it. You know, uh, write the vision, make it plain. Uh, now, I want to read this last thing to you. When, when, when you look at that 10,000 foot view, though, when you see your annual expenses, it may be like looking at a mountain. Don't even be afraid. Listen to the word of God. In Mark 11, verse 23, it says, for, sure, for assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. That's what the word I want to leave you guys with, because sometimes when you guys add up all of your bills and look at everything, it may look insurmountable to you. But remember what the word of God says. No doubt in your heart. Believe what God says and, and uh, it will be done and you'll, you'll have whatever, whatever he says. You know, faith without works is dead. I want you guys to put what, what was taught in the class to work so that, you know, be faithful in your budget. Uh, the definition of faithful uh, means uh, to be steadfast in affection or allegiance, firm, firm in adherence to promises or, or in observance of duty, given with strong assurance, true to the facts, to a standard or to an original, be faithful in your budget, y'all. This is Finances for Life. All right, we're good to go. All right, you get in the stream.